So we have a very distinguished uh, panel here today. Uh, to my left is Ajit uh, Gulabchand, who's one of India's uh, very distinguished, uh, uh, should I call you an urbanizer or an uh, industrialist or an entrepreneur, all rolled into one. And uh, then we have Shushmita Mohanty, who's the ch chief executive officer of Earth to Orbit Consulting. And uh, then we have uh, Param Ayer, who's uh, secretary, uh, Ministry of Drinking, water and who's uh, done an enormous job of uh, taking this uh, Swachh Bharat mission to at its implementation stage and done a tremendous job of it. And uh, we have with us Amarjit Singh, who's uh, Secretary uh, water. water Resources, Government of India, and another uh, great uh, official who's committed to the cause of water in India. So let me first turn to Ajit. Ajit, 700 million people are going to get into the process of urbanization by 2050, according to the uh, McKinsey study. Uh, we have 17% uh, of the world's population, just 4% of the water resources. We are almost at the level of water scarcity. How are we going to manage this process of urbanization? What do we need to do? Well, I think. <coughs> First, I think we need to get back to some of the, the very basics about water that we all need to understand. Uh, I began with the signing the United Nations CEO mandate on water long ago, when we were just five, seven of us, and started the initiative in the World Economic Forum. And there are some very fundamental learnings that we were quite surprised that how much we know little about the usage of water. For one, we think that we need water. New York, that gives you about 220 liters per head of water per day as a water supply for your, your needs and your sanitation. And there are other cities that give you less, 160. And there are those who are shortage cities. But that's, therefore, our concept of water is that this is all the water we need. But that is not true. Every individual human being uh, average needs about 10,000 liters of water, not just 200 liters of water. Out of that, about 7,500 liters of water we eat, which our food that we eat requires to grow. Then about 2,000 liters of water is substantially give, required for all the manufactured products that we have, including our buildings cars, everything. And then you come down to about 5 to 7% of the water that we consume is really drinking water and sanitation. So when we talk of simply cities and providing cities with water, we're talking of a very small percentage. And we use water very badly. The only country in the world that uses water very efficiently is Israel. Even the United States uses the water very badly. The Colorado is almost di dying at one end. And then we need to do that. About For food, for example, one-sixth of the water is required by Israel, whereas we need that much more. So the rest of the water, whether you use it for industrial use or whether you use it for drinking and sanitation, can be recycled. Almost all of it can be recycled and reused. <coughs> so. The city's problem is that it actually consumes 10,000 liters per head, but in, in, within the city it consumes only, only about uh, up, uh, 200 to 300 liters. The rest of it is consumed on his behalf by the farmer elsewhere. Yeah. So how are we now going to tie this equation for city survival is going to be the question. As far as the sanitation and this water is concerned, good schemes of recycling and a good understanding of doing so uh, it, it's got to be done now i we've done this in the city of lavasa we were building up in the hills we've we've had perfectly portable water of from our sewage treatment plant at the end of the day obviously we have not used it for drinking we used it for the greening of the place but the fact is that you can do that and so i don't see if we canalize ourselves and have 
effective methods of doing so that we can. But our real problem is going to lie in how are we going to reduce the water consumption at our agricultural end. And that is where the real scarcity is going to take place, that the feeding the people in the cities with food enough and needing water is where your problem okay. really okay. lies. Okay. So, Sushmita, tell me, I mean, we 84% of our water getting into irrigation. Uh, we are taking about four times more water per unit of crop than what uh, USA or Brazil or China does. How do we get more uh, productivity per unit of water? So I come to this um, world of water from a very different angle, from outer space. Um, my first experience the first 15 years being a spaceship designer where I designed habitats and rovers to live in outer space in the near future. If you look at the space shuttle, I just take a couple of steps back, uh, Amitabh, and just give a little bit of context here. On the space shuttle, for example, which used to have two week missions and seven astronauts, uh, we didn't have to bring water on board. We had fuel cells, and the byproduct was water, and we were producing enough water four times what was necessary on the space shuttle. It used to be a two-week uh, trip. On the space station that's orbiting the Earth as we speak, we, we take water from Earth. And um, also looking at Earth from space using satellites, there have been NASA studies which have revealed the Indus River ba Basin, which is right here, um, is one of the most depleted, stressed aquifers in the world, uh, where we have Punjab, Delhi, Haryana, Sindh, and what have you. And now I've, uh, I mean, I've moved on from designing for living in space to looking at Earth from space and leveraging big data analytics to solve problems here on Earth. And again, coming back to your, how do we increase yield, you said, per whatever it might be, per square meter, whatever. I think the Netherlands is a fantastic example. Now I'm going to talk about technology a little bit. So Netherlands, I know Israel is a fantastic example too, but Netherlands is my favorite when it comes to increasing yield per square meter, per square uh, foot, or whatever you have. It's one of the most compact nations. Uh, human density is very high. And what they have done is they have perfected a couple of things. One is greenhouse technology which allows you to grow things round the clock. Greenhouses are climate agnostic. Doesn't matter what it is, things will grow. And to improve yield, what they've done is the best use of things like natural fertilizers. I've seen tomato plants in Netherlands, which are like twice our height, and fish waste is a great example of a compost accelerator. So how do you not use chemical fertilizers? How do you use organic fertilizers? How do you make your plants resistant to disease and stress of any sort by putting them in greenhouses or certain environments. Um, it's totally doable. If a country like the Netherlands can do it, like if you compare our tomato output to, to theirs, yeah. it's quite stark, the per capita, yeah. per yield kind of thing. Yeah. So we can do it with technology, sure. it's possible. Sure. Uh, so Param, you've been leading this uh, uh, unique movement, the Swachh Bharat mission, and uh, what an amazing job you've done of uh, construction of <coughs> uh, How have you been able to get water for this? And uh, how have you affected behavioral change? To my mind, it's not just about hardware, it's about the softer element of changing the mindset of people to use uh, toilets with lesser amount of water. Yeah, so like you said, Amitabh, you know, this is, uh, I think it's the, it's the largest behavior change program in the world, right? <laughs> uh, that's what we're trying to do. And as you said, it's not about uh, building toilets, it's about the usage of toilets, and that's done through behavior change, both to triggering uh, through interpersonal communication, but also through mass media. So I think one of the important things which the Prime Minister has repeatedly emphasized, this is not a Sarkari program, you know, it's, it's, it's supposed to be a Jan Andolan, a people's movement. And I think that uh, this program, three years of implementation, is fairly close to a tipping point. I think that everyone is aware about Swaj Bharat. There might be some differing views about it. But on the whole, I think it's a program which has captured the people's imagination. And we need to continue focus on the core aspect of this program, which is behavior change. Now, you, you spoke about water. So clearly, uh, water generally, as the speakers before me have mentioned, is a, it's a security issue. And in India, you can look at water either at the water security, the water resource management, the larger perspective, or you can look at it from service delivery. 
which is you know my area, which is both drinking water and sanitation, and both are equally important. The way one of the things we are uh, trying to address the water and sanitation linkage is through two perspectives. If you look at it from a policy perspective, what the finance minister announced in his budget speech is that every open defecation free village will have an incentive, will be prioritized for pipe water supply. So there's an inherent incentive to become open defecation free. And the other is from a technological point of view, uh, the rural toilet, the low cost toilet uses something called a steep slope pan, which requires only a liter and a half to flush as opposed to the urban pan, which requires five liters. So it comes back to the basic principles which the two speakers have spoken about, which is reduce, reuse, and recycle. So that's applicable both to water and to sanitation. But let me also add, since this is the World Economic Forum, there's an economic value to sanitation as well as water. You know, in <coughs> 1990, these were known as the Dublin-Rio principles, where it, everyone agreed that water <coughs> is both an economic good but should also be managed at the lowest appropriate level. Now take sanitation. Uh, the World Bank did a study in 2007, which established that the lack of sanitation is costing India over 6% <coughs> of GDP. Recently, UNICEF did a study for us uh, because we wanted to look at it at a micro level. So what is it costing a household not to have sanitation? And they found that it's as much as 50,000 rupees, mentioned by the Prime Minister a couple of days ago. So each household on average is going to save 50,000 rupees by having a toilet, so avoiding uh, health costs, time savings, etc. So there's an economic value to sanitation. There's an economic value to water. And I think that the convergence of water and sanitation, although critical, uh, you can actually look at them separately and you can look at them together. But uh, each has got an economic value. Okay. Great, wonderful. Uh, so Amarjeet, uh, I mean, we're just going deeper and deeper and getting into ground water, converting, you know, for uh, irrigation purposes, for drinking water, for urban needs. We're just digging ground water and we're converting large areas of India into desert. I mean, look at Punjab, look at Haryana, look at Rajasthan. Vast areas we are converting into desert. When are we going to have strict regulation? How do we rejuvenate these areas? Let me just take you a step before that. I mean, a silent revolution is going on in parts of the country. If you look at the experience of uh, Madhya Pradesh, their utilization of their infrastructure was only 8 lakh hectares. They're using all the infrastructure and irrigating 8 lakh hectares. Today, they irrigate 4 million hectares with the same amount of infrastructure just by uh, plugging the gaps. I think that's one thing, because 80% of water, as you said, 80 to 84% of water is being used for agriculture. That's where our maximum emphasis has to be. Now, the states which have done it, like Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat, they are reaping the benefits. The rate of growth is about 12 to 13% for agriculture. But the states where we have not been able to put our house in order, there is more and more emphasis on groundwater. People have to have water for their crops. And that's where the bigger problem is lying. And that's a belt from Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Vidarbha and Marathawada, Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka. So what, to answer your question, what we're trying to do is we're trying to have a national aquifer for mapping program, which tells us how much water is there, what is the quality of water, what is the quantity available, and how best it can be utilized. Let's give you one small example from a place called Kudalur in Tamil Nadu, which is a coastal area. When we presented the maps of that NACWIM to the Kudlur community, they realized how much seawater was ingressing into their areas. And the communities themselves decided that they're going to draw less and less water so that the seawater doesn't ingress. And that's the idea. You do the mapping of the underground waters, let people know what's the water available and what are the options for that, so that they can take wise decisions on their own. So community involvement. Community involvement has to be a big key of that. Yeah, but tell me, I mean, all these state governments investing huge amounts of money into vast irrigation projects, water not reaching the ultimate consumer, not reaching the ultimate farmer. What are you doing about it? I think the, the, we have to give you uh, a little credit publicly. We, for the first time, we have taken up a project where government has put in 77,000 crores to ensure that all the projects which are incomplete, they are completed in a time-worn manner. And I'm happy to tell you 
almost 25 of those projects are complete and periphery is actually reaching the people. The Prime Minister has also taken a decision that wherever the dams are complete, but water is not reaching the farmer, make sure command area development works are taken up. And that's another project which we are taking. And once these two projects are completed by the year 2022-23, we will have all irrigation infrastructure accounted for. And how much design, how much water, and how much area actually being I irrigated. I just add, while we are on the praise Amitabh bit, uh, got to give credit to Amitabh for developing a water index. Yeah, so all state absolutely. governments with 100 parameters <coughs> are now being competitively ranked to see how they're doing across the spectrum of water security, all the way from water resource management down to service delivery. So there's an element of competition. I think it's healthy competition to see how are states faring on the index. I think that was driven by Amitabh. Yeah, but with one mind. small point, and I, that's where we need your help and leadership. I think we, the way we treat irrigation water as cheap water, it is actually very, very expensive. Yeah. We need to measure it. We need to put it on a volumetric no, no, basis. You raise this yeah. point volumetric I, I, basis I, I, and no, charge for it. Yeah, but I wanted to turn to both of you, both, yeah. both of you are policy makers. No. Uh, the two critical issues to my mind. Is there a case for pricing water, particularly ground water, uh, number one? Number two, how do we shift farmers to less intensive water crops? If I can just take a quick crack at that, Amitabh. Yeah. You know, uh, I wrote a paper once when I was in, uh, in the bank on uh, willingness to pay and willingness to charge. Mm. And I think that mm -hmm. there is willingness to pay for good service, yeah. but to sometimes there's unwillingness to charge. And you know, we are accountable for that along with our political masters. Mm. But I think that if you provide good service, even people, there's an assumption that people are not willing to pay, actually they are. And the, the experience from across the world is, that good service, you can price water. Mm. You need to have good efficient regulation. We don't have good regulation in India. So, mm. you know, it should it be a central thing. It's probably a state regulation because water is a state subject. So you can price. There's got to be willingness to charge and it's got to be regulated or you won't have the confidence. I'm sure people like Ajit will tell you that, you know, why would anyone invest unless there is appropriate and, and fair regulation? Can I add one more thing to it? Both what Amarjeet and Mr. R said, I think for the average citizen to be able to visualize, quote unquote, visualize what's happening to the aquifers. I think just as in Chennai, they were able to see, let's say a time series of what's happened to water in their area. That becomes your first step hmm. towards convincing them yeah. of uh, embracing metrics, embracing a certain pay structure. I think visualization yeah. is very powerful. And I think Amarjeet's example is a so very So just good. put it in public domain. No, but but also, more. you need data to be able to create the time series and show them, right? Once Earth data. One more, which uh, Gujarat saw long back, is that we haven't still broken the energy water <coughs> nexus. We keep on providing free energy. Farmers just well, put on the light colossal. and let the water come when it comes and let it be there. I think that nexus has to be broken. Yes. We have to make sure that yeah. energy which is supplied for water is metered and charge so that people use it well. He's right so, there. See, when you look at the, how are we doing? We are giving water free, we are giving electricity free. So you're, go, you're creating a recipe from overuse of water all the time. Why not think in terms of what Israel has done, is precision agriculture, where you talk of <laughs> drip irrigation as one such form of providing the minimal water in order to get the maximum. That's how they reduce the consumption of water required for agriculture to one-sixth. Now, if you do that and you create a new form, today we give a lot of subsidies to farm. One of the ways could be that we give you subsidized uh, water drip irrigation equipment. We will charge you for more than one-sixth the water that you normally would require. Now, up to one-sixth, say, if your consumption today is 100, one-sixth of that goes free for you, but the balance will be charged because water in the end is a, is a social good, when it's purely drinking or some of the important uses, not to let allow any man go thirsty. It's a commercial good because when it comes to economic good, the farmer is making money selling his produce, and so are companies. So you've got to charge that differently. And we forget that water is also an environmental good. We have to live, leave 50% of the water we have for 
it to create a sustainable environment. So when you look at it this way, the charge for any of these water that you require can be different. Uh, from absolutely no charge to a very heavy charge for environmental water. So I think if we can slightly tweak our policies to encourage precision agriculture, a little more of this, I think we might be able to marry both the concept of educating the people. While educating the people has a sense of value, I have not noticed people, despite of their putting stickers on their bumpers about climate change, are really willing to pay for the extra cost of that. The, at the end of the day, what it means to them is how it works for them economically as well. Yeah. And I think this is where perhaps mixing of these two policies. But Amarji, tell me, is there a case for separating power feeders for agriculture? Absolutely. Yeah. The Jyoti Gram Yojana in Gujarat is Dib the Dib model Dib way forward. We should do it in all states. Hmm. People should get water on a charged meter for a limited <laughs> amount of time. And I'll go a step further and say, if you're getting public energy hmm. at public cost, you use it with drip irrigation. You don't just flood irrigation in your fields. You use with drip irrigation. We should make it mandatory. If you're using public funds for getting water to your field, you better use them optimally. I'll give you a small example, and I invite all the people to see that. There is a place called Sanchor. If you go from Jodhpur towards Palantur, the Narmada waters, maximum water is with Madhya Pradesh, then Gujarat, and the least with Rajasthan. Yet they use that water so effectively for the same amount of crops they use 0.6 units of water. Gujarat uses one, and Madhya Pradesh uses two units of water. Mm -hmm. And they've done a wonderful work. You start driving from Jodhpur, it's all barren. The moment you reach Sanchor, and it's 300,000 acres, oh. it's all green, and lovely crops growing there. Wonderful. And I but think that's a model which needs to be taken forward. So Gujarat is a great story of success yeah, of water tables having company. gone up. Yeah. 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 Water tables having gone Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. But that. you're saying Sanchor has done better than Gujarat. Sanchor has done <laughs> the best in the country hmm. on a large scale in using limited amount of water most productively. Yeah. I, I also think, Amita, we should not simplify agriculture, precision agriculture, to only drip irrigation. Because we also, I mean, I come from the world of space where we build greenhouses and stuff. So I think hydroponics, how do you use less soil and other kinds of nutrients? I mean, these are technologies that are readily available, but how do we get it to the farmers? Now, that's a challenge. That's the last mile I challenge. think, sir, one thing you should do, good. sir, put energy, water resources, and agriculture together, what she's mm -hmm. saying. We have, and agriculture has to make sure <coughs> Whatever little water is available is optimized. You know, but I'm, I'm suddenly amazed, you know, that in the last two years, I find a lot of innovative work happening in the field. Yes. Many chief ministers are driving change, you know. I mean, film actors like Amir Khan are getting into water management. Sure. Uh, you know, and I find a unique amount of work happening on ground in water. Yes. Yes. So would you like yes. to dwell on some of these unique things, Parth? So, yeah, no, absolutely. So there are a lot of innovations, as you mentioned. Amir Khan is focusing on water conservation yeah. in Maharashtra. You know, Agriculture takes up 80-85%. Now, if you look at the remaining 15%, mm. a, lot of a lot of it is going for drinking water. Mm. Now look at urban water supply. The first are the reduce. We need to be more efficient. So today, Delhi, the non-revenue water is about 50%. Mm. You go to the Jerusalem yeah. uh, city, there's a utility, which is it, the non-revenue water is 6%. Ho Chi Minh city, about 15%. Uh, Haiphong, which was bombed by the Americans during the Vietnam War, yeah. is about 15%. So there's huge scope in more efficiencies. Yeah, but you I need a lot of political will in Delhi to do that. That's yeah, you, right. need, you need a lot of political will in Delhi and in other cities. <coughs> but any city in India, yeah. your non-revenue water is 40 to 50%. Yeah. Yeah. So if we can plug the leaks itself, so you know, it's not so much, it's always a supply issue, but it's even more a demand issue. Yeah. And how do you manage you know, that? With other interesting examples, sir, I was in Kota some time back. Kota has a population of 1.5 million, all the students who go for competitive exams. The <coughs> dam there is reserved for Kota Thermal Power Station. Mm. Okay. People don't get that fresh water. The entire waste of the river, waste of the city, 1.5 million population, goes into River Chambal, it mucks up the river. Easily we could recycle that water of 1.5 million, wastewater of 1.5 million population, feed the thermal power station, Kota thermal power station, and use the fresh water of the dam for city, 
and save the river. But even for agriculture, so you take yeah, Israel, 86% yeah. of the irrigation for agriculture is coming is waste treated wastewater. Mm. Yeah, In India, it's negligible. So I'm that's saying it. we generate a huge amount of wastewater. Mm. And if we start treating that wastewater to a certain standard, so you do a primary, secondary, you do a little bit of tertiary, you can reuse yeah, and you know huge scope particularly in areas adjacent to municipalities <coughs> we can easily do that and there are some innovations coming up on that front so what that param is talking is 40 billion liters of water per day which could be recycled easily uh, uh, we have a serious danger in india our water bases have completely eroded except the brahmaputra basin the yeah. northeast is fine which but is the rest which is, is fine yeah. but the rest of the water basins have eroded this is the bad news. But the good news is they can be restored yeah. with low-hanging fruit need to, protect to, and reach us to very high. How do we do that? Mm. I think if, it's got to be a little more serious mission mode on the subject. Uh, so my that. view is that, uh, um, Amarjeet, you need, so. to, you need to quickly do this and declare them as environmentally sensitive zones and put this in public domain and say that we're not going to tamper these areas because these are extremely sensitive areas. So two things uh, which might uh, please you. Uh, if you look at Narmada, it gives so much water to Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat. If you look at the starting point, Amarkanta, mm. there are a lo lot of reserve forest. Mm. And there are no glaciers, there is no snow. And that those yes. reserve forests feed the Narmada. So what we are trying to do now is that the Bagirthi zone, the entire Bagirthi zone for Ganges is, is declared as an eco-sensitive zone. You don't do any projects there and it is preserved because it's one of the pristine areas left in the world. So those are some of the things and we are looking at the catchment area treatment which uh, Vilap Chanji is saying in a very, very serious manner so that the rejuvenation of the rivers is done. Already there are two, three examples in Kerala of that happening. And they've done some good work on that and that we have to scale that up. Again, recharge, Amitabh, is a very doable thing. We've developed a model with my new company where we can look at, let's say Bangalore, in the early, in the 60s, we had about 260 odd water bodies. And a lot of these water bodies were created in the 16th century by Kemper Gowda and then Vodiar, where they dammed valley systems. So these are man-made lakes. And now mm. we barely have 30 odd left. Mm. The way we are doing this is we are looking at Bangalore, for example, from space. And we can create a water map and also tell you how to recharge older water bodies, which are also interconnected, by the way. And what are the better places for new watershed catchments? It's, it's very doable. So I, I, what I'm trying to say is the technology is there yeah. for all kinds no, of sir, measures. I think we must send you to Bundelkhand region of uh, UP and Madhya Pradesh mm -hmm. and use your technical expertise to you actually revive it. that whole region. If I can, can absolutely if, do it. If I can just make one, you know, we've spoken about technology, we've spoken about economics, about subsidies. There's one critical part which we haven't touched upon yet. That's the institutional part. If you look at government, which should play the role of a, a facilitator, a regulator, you know, water, Amarjeet's got the bulk of it, water resources ministry. Water is in about seven ministries in the government of India. Mm -hmm. So I do rural water and sanitation. Urban is urban. Amarjeet does the big stuff, the dams, the rivers, agriculture, rural development, watershed development. And then the states. And then the states. And the same story in the states. In UP, for example, my state, there's <coughs> a command area development upon minor irrigation, major irrigation. So we don't speak to each other. So unless you look at you look at Israel, small country, we keep coming back to Israel, as was mentioned, Ministry of Water and Power. So they talk to each other. You know, they don't cross subsidize each other. So we need to have integration at an institution level at the center and the state. Very so important. So the uh, while I agree with Param uh, on what he's saying of the segmented approach, but most of the initiatives are happening in the state sector. Right. Mm -hmm. If you go to Karnataka and look at the mission Kakatya spending 20 to 30,000 of their own funds to rejuvenate their tanks, water bodies, reservoirs. And it is working extremely well. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's something which needs to be scaled yeah. up. So number of great practices, you know, and so uh, what I find is that a huge amount of innovation is happening. In the states. Efficiency work is happening. I mean, uh, look at what Telangana is doing. Absolutely. Look at what Rajasthan is doing. Look at what... And this sudden movement for managing water and suddenly politicians are realizing that if you don't provide governance in water, it's very difficult to get re-elected. So challenge mode, as you said, Amitabh, yeah. is critical. So yeah. now, as you said, and as Amarjeet is pointing out, state governments are taking the lead. Yeah. So what we are doing in the National Rural Drinking Water Program is now, with your support, is yeah. to put it on challenge mode. Yeah. 
So earlier state governments had a sense of entitlement. Yeah. You know, we're going to get this money based on our population, based on our desert area. So we're now saying, listen, you pre-finance, you deliver goods based on outcomes, third party verification, and it's a common pot of money, and let's open it up. Yeah. Because if a state like Telangana is going to spend 46,000 crores under Mission Bhagirathi mm -hmm. to provide water supply to each household, yeah. Gujarat is doing it, Punjab is doing it, Kerala is doing it, why can't the other states take the lead themselves and why are they dependent on GOI yeah. subsidies? Yeah. So I think that approach which the Niti Aayog is pushing is going to make no, a big so difference. We've, we've gone on record to say that everything that Government of India does should be through a challenge route, whether it's mm. All India Institute of Medical Sciences, whether it's engineering colleges, or whether it's IIMs, or whether it's water projects, everything should be through a challenge method. Let states compete for it and the more states compete they will do due diligence you'll have land you'll have approvals in place and projects will get implemented much quicker much faster so i think uh, that's a unique uh, thing to happen uh, i i just wanted to ask you on uh, you know because somehow i feel that state governments and politicians love to do these uh, command area works you know <laughs> too much of gravy curry there Come so on, they do they love this good. big big there's this construction involved large scale projects involved and, uh, you know, some of the water never reaches the ultimate farmer. And, you know, we've, we've, my, check, my view is that it's very important to work backwards from the farmer, the last farmer. What are we doing for that? So you, you, you are asking me questions <laughs> for which I have to start by thanking you, sir. The first thing we've done is we are focusing on water user associations. The tail and farmers has to get the water. Once the water has reached the village, it has to be distributed by the water user association. The second, sir, you made it mandatory. Niti has made it mandatory. We have got satellite pictures of every command area. We know how much actually water is reaching. The third part is, sir, when we sit in the PMO and you are there in those meetings, I say so many hectares irrigated. The principal secretary to the PM turns to the secretary of agriculture, aap batao kitna mila. So there are a number of checks and balances. I think the, the loose manner in which we were functioning, some of the states are functioning earlier, can't go on. Sir. So for the first time, what you're doing, the is ultimate this, consumer, that is the agriculture We'll get the water, sir. So not, a, not only the ultimate yeah. consumer, the tail end farmer will yeah, get yeah. the water, sir. Mm -hmm. no, but one more question, I, I mean, it's, it's a source of great worry for me. You know, I mean, over the years, over centuries, uh, we've, you know, historically, we've constructed a lot of ponds, water tanks, a mm -hmm. uh, lot of water bodies which have gone into and we start creating fresh infrastructure. How do we revive this unique heritage of India? Look, I, I think that the Ministry of Rural Development is making a huge effort in this direction. Mm. So Amarjit Sena's department working with uh, Amarjit Singh, they are focusing a lot on precisely this. Now, you know, they are, they are rejuvenating ponds. They're working on these water bodies. I think in the end, it's all about incentives. And how do you incentivize state governments which manage water? How do you incentivize local bodies to revive these bodies? So I think there's a movement going on there, but there's much more work to be done. Because as you said, historically, there are these water bodies, there are these old <coughs> monuments, excellent structures which have been sort of taken over by, typically by urban development. You know, they've been built over and a lot of restoration work is going on. Much more needs to be done but it's got to be squarely incentivized. Yeah. So, so Ajit, tell me one thing, you know, you live in Mumbai, yeah. and why can't we get into dynamic pricing of water like Singapore does, have different rates for different consumption levels? I mean, rich people like you consume a lot of water, why shouldn't you pay more? Uh, you're absolutely right. What he said is not the willingness to pay, it's the willingness to charge. Because there is a feeling and a perception amongst the politician that if I charge for water, there will be an uproar that look at you for my own water, you are charging me money, and that he would lose popularity. Now, I think this is, there's a lot of truth in it, that he would also lose popularity, <coughs> despite the fact that the, the consumer will, his user is willing to pay. Yet, it's got to be a bold move, and it has got to be done in a certain fashion that, that, that gives, clarifies the difference between the users, and then charges it accordingly. Like for example, we today subsidize water, which is, comes to your home in taps. Most people 
who got a tap at their home already live in buildings that are at the upper end of the yeah, income. Yeah, but why, I mean, why are you waiting for politicians? Why doesn't the CII get together and say that we want a dynamic mm. pricing of water? Why shouldn't the demand come from the industry? Well, or the consumers? Yeah, the sliding scale is a great idea. Yeah, I agree. yeah it's, 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 yeah, it's, because, it's an idea you know, that I mean, can be taken up. Yes, what yes. Singapore has shown it, doesn't, it doesn't have to come only from government. It yeah. can come from this also. Yeah. And I think I will take it up with CII that we should take a look at the making a, a proposition to the government that you start charging water. Yeah. You don't, you're charging low, wa low prices to the water that comes into NCPA buildings. Yeah. And the poor goes, buys water at 12 rupees a bottle. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, there's, there's huge coping costs. <laughs> exactly. <have> which, <coughs> so Singapore example has shown that it's significantly impacted water usage. And uh, you know, the minute you start doing it, people will understand the real value of, of doing this. And that's the only way to go, according to me. And, and speaking of drip irrigation farmers, I think the other big focus should yeah. be on domestic and commercial consumption. And what I mean by that is even 10 years ago in Japan, when I was living in a, I was living in a youth hostel, and you have these pulse showers. Or if you're an aircraft, a jetliner, you get, you know, the kind of water you get in the toilets on an aircraft. So I think homes and businesses, including the Taj right here, should have pulse taps whether it's the one in the basin or the one in the shower. And I think we have the technology. I, I met with some young innovators in Hyderabad a couple of weeks ago who have designed this kind of an IoT system mm. and a sensor-based system which you can put in your pipes and you can measure to the last drop. Mm. So we have everything we need. I think it's a matter of how do you bring it down to the last user. So I think providing water is not enough. I think it's all about reducing the consumption of water. At yeah. every level, at every level. I mean, so if, one, if, if one more thing yeah. which uh, people have not realized, sir, we, we are a huge country and we need different solutions to different states, different zones. While there is overdrawal of water, which you mentioned, on the western side, northern side, the whole of east is sitting over so much water. groundwater, <laughs> it is not being utilized because there is no electricity and people can't afford diesel. Yeah. Now, if you can somehow provide electricity in the eastern part of the country, the Bihar aquifer is sitting over 28 BCM of water, which is three times the Narmada Dam, which it took 40 years yeah. to build. Now, there's so much water available, but <coughs> lack of enterprise, electricity not being available, people are just not able to draw it, and they keep on living at, at sub-poverty levels. If we can manage some of the eastern groundwater, mm. so just to give you an example, sir, in Punjab, the drawal rate is almost 200. Yeah. 100 recharge, drawal 200. It is only 28 to 30 in Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal, mm -hmm. Assam. So there's so much more scope for drawing water there. Yeah. So you keep coming back to groundwater, as Amarjit mentioned, eastern part in particular, but not many people know that India mines more groundwater than China and America combined. Yes. Put together. Yes. yes. That's right. Yes. That's yes. This, this, this is being, it's being mined, right? So effective groundwater management, it's linked to energy subsidies, but our groundwater is a critical resource. No, it's, a, it's a, according no, you know, no, to no. my mind, it's the biggest source of worry because you've reached levels in Punjab where you're digging out poison. Really, I mean, it's all acidic water. Yeah. Or Chennai. So, yeah. But Amadeep, I don't, I don't, I partially dis disagree with you. No, about you the use it sustainably. Bit. Yeah, I think yeah. the eastern, uh, the eastern states and the northeast should take it as an opportunity to not, you know, go the way the west or the south have gone. But look at even energy from a renewable, sustainable point of view. And rather than emptying the reserves they have, take a completely sustainable approach to both energy no, no, and I, water. I never said empty. If you look at the Gangetic Plains, so much water during the monsoon. So you're yeah. saying yeah. That So yeah. there is a possibility of recharging parts. those equipments. Uh, yeah. Okay, fair enough. So but That's the point I was trying. Right, right. Okay. So I think we've had a very fascinating discussion. I think it's uh, water is the most critical resource for India. And uh, this is going to decide in many ways India's ability to govern itself, India's ability to do urbanization, India's ability to do economic development, and uh, India's ability to grow at high rates over the next three to four decades. Uh, many of us keep focusing on a vast range of areas, but to my mind, water is the most critical resource. And I think it's important 
if we have to grow at high rates over a long period of time, we need to manage water very well. We need to manage water very efficiently. We need to regulate our groundwater resources. We need to restore and rejuvenate many of our water bodies. We need to provide separate power feeders for agriculture. We need to think very uh, strongly in terms of pricing groundwater so that we can impact water usage. We need to protect and preserve our recharge zones. We need to bring in greater innovation and efficiency in irrigation systems. And we need to shift farmers to less water intensive crops. And lastly, I would say that I, we hope that this new water management index where we'll be ranking states and we, where we'll be putting states on a name, to name and shaming basis that states which are not perform performing will be shamed will have a major impact on water management in India. Thank you very much. Anything yeah, else? Yes, yeah. yeah, please. There's one more thing. In this, we are still talking of an excessive role of government in doing things. Can we also create some, allow some local cell bodies, empower them, so the people take charge of their own lives too? Let the boys yeah. be. Yeah. You might get a little improved management. So when we do the water management index, actually we are, while we are doing ranking of states, the next year we will do water management index for local bodies, the yes. panchayats, so that they will, they will then be ranked and yeah. uh, they will be named and shamed. And hopefully that would lead to community mm -hmm. participation, exactly like what uh, uh, we have water uh, users, water users body and like uh, Param has done in the Swachh Bharat mm -hmm. mission. These are all uh, community led movements. Yeah. So thank you very much ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Interacting with you. Thank you.